Hello, my part-time seniors who are about to graduate and have to have your entire block completed by, I don't know, when, today. Um, what you're going to be doing is taking a final exam and I am going to be helping you out with uh, that. So you should be able to complete that final if you pay attention to this video. So in your chapter, there's actually, in your review for this test, there's a portion called From Baroque to Romantic. So I'm gonna go through these questions really quick. During the Baroque period, artists relied on the Catholic Church, royalty, or wealthy citizens for commissions and tailored their works to reflect the needs of their patron. Yes, the patron would be the Catholic Church, the royal person, or the wealthy citizen who commissioned or paid the artist to do that work. So yes, they would be reflecting the needs of the patron. Baroque artists appreciated the lifelike depiction of figures in the Renaissance, but not their static poses. So hopefully you remember we had that class where you were able to tell the difference between Baroque art and Renaissance art. Remember the Renaissance sculpture of David was just kind of standing there like, hey baby. But the Baroque was very energetic. His body, his torso was completely twisted. It caught him in the moment of action just as he was about to slay Goliath, right? So caught him in the most intense, dramatic moment of action. That's Baroque. You see the word drama? Think Baroque. They're synonymous. Baroque painters and sculptures rendered figures with dramatic active poses as if stopped in mid-action. Baroque artists created drama <laughs> and painted and sculpted figures that appear to extend into the viewer's space and engage them in the action. What's that called? Foreshortening. Foreshortening. Okay, that's when the figure in the painting is either going into your space or coming out of the space, but it's very dynamic in that way. The ornate, ornate, what does that mean? Ornamental, okay? Ornate, very decorative, think Rococo, all right? The ornate Rococo style emphasized light-hearted themes of romantic courtship and leisure activities over Baroque's epic or religious themes. Remember that Rococo period was that French period where it was really super frilly and just over the top decor, huge beehive hairdos with like butterflies and bird's nest popping out of them. Baby blue, pink, pastel colors, okay? Rococo. Neoclassical artists, so neoclassical, think back to the classical time. Yes, I know we didn't go there too much, but classical period was um, way back when we had like Socrates and Plato and they had like the columns and things like that our White House is based on. Our White House is very classical, the Parthenon. This was neoclassical, okay? Thomas Jefferson was totally into it. And um, so you'll see a lot of that type of architecture in our government. Neoclassical artists and architects, uh, architects abandoned the ornamentation of the Rococo style wasn't very serious, right? Can you imagine our White House being Rococo? That would be like insanely ridiculous. In favor of the balance and harmony of classical works. That's what classical work is all about. It's balanced, it's harmonic, it's symmetrical. Okay, you might have been tempted to think of, but asymmetrical means that it's not symmetrical. So. Neoclassical, balanced, harmony, classical, columns, pillars, all that good stuff. Nudes. Romantic artists rebelled against the rational, orderly quality of neoclassical art in their emotional scenes filled with danger, adventure, and political turmoil. 
All right. So that's from Baroque to Romantic. All right, let's move on to the review from Realism to Post-Impressionism. So we're just going to be filling in the blanks. The Industrial Revolution of the 19th century had a profound effect on art and architecture. The art of photography was born, and some painters embraced a new realism in their work based on photographs. Architects took advantage of new materials and mass production techniques in their forward-looking styles. In 1837, Louis Daguerre produced the daguerreotype, the first permanent photographic image. This new medium opened up a wealth of possibility for artists. It helped them translate the three-dimensional world into two dimensions. Yet some artists rejected photography as an artistic medium, believing it was a shortcut. Which of the following statements best describes the paintings of 19th century realists and naturalists? So remember that realism is based on scenes of contemporary everyday life as the scenes really appeared in the physical world, okay? This is an example. All right. Impressionist painters broke new ground by forsaking realist traditions rather than capturing an accurate representation of a scene the artists painted their impressions of the luminous effect of sunlight on objects by using lively brush strokes and vibrant color the development of oil paint in tubes allowed artists to work outdoors directly from life so they were trying to escape from the studio. They like to paint outside. Post-Impressionist painters took the artistic style of their predecessors, the Impressionists, in new directions, uh, not content with spontaneous paintings of light and shadow, the artists made their paintings look more, I just am not pleased with this test question, but I guess they would say look more solid. They used color and bold distinctive brushwork to express their emotional response. So I'm not sure what they mean by solid here. But the point is, Impressionists were concerned about light, the way the sunlight hit objects, and just capturing the spontaneity of the moment, just capturing that fleeting moment. The Impressionists used bolder colors, and they used more intense brush strokes, and some of them, you know, just... You know what I'm trying to say. Think Van Gogh, right? Think Van Gogh when you think post-impressionism. Look how bold and colorful his works are, okay? But the point the post-impressionists were trying to make was to express their emotions, their feelings. Symbolist artists rejected the perceived materialism brought about by an industrialized society. They used line, color, and symbols to express their emotional reaction to their surroundings. In condemning the monotony or boredom of the modern mechanized era, Art Nouveau artists found inspiration in the curving lines and shapes of the natural world. So 
so if we needed to match up each of these images, we've got Henry Turner's The Thankful Poor. This is definitely realist, right? That's realism. That is a scene that you would have actually seen. We've got Monet's Water Lily Pond, and this would be impressionist okay so he's capturing the light not necessarily purposefully trying to evoke emotional responses um, then we have here um, Cezanne's mountain picture of a mountain here and um, he's using like shapes he's blocking off these shapes okay be thinking of that all right that's a post impressionist painting there with vibrant colors and that type of thing okay so then we have monks the scream and this one right here is going to be your symbolist artwork huge emotional reaction to the monotony of the industrialized world right don't we all feel that way sometimes like you just want to scream it's so mundane and then this right here we have the nice curves of nature this is your art nouveau by tiffany so let's move on to our final unit a fine art B modern times and this is a unit that um, is open up if you can um, just kind of scroll through and skim it and take a look at it that'd be great this would be your review of that so 20th century artists took art in uncharted directions by ignoring or rewriting the rules and accepted conventions of traditional art the Fauves or wild beasts who invented cubism use intensely modeled shapes that bore little relation to reality. German expressionists created works by distorting their subjects to communicate intense emotion, often angst. Cubists reduced objects in their paintings to basic geometric forms, showing them from several viewpoints. So that's why a cubist painting looks so confusing because it's actually showing you different angles all at one time. During the Great Depression, American scene painters depicted distinctly American subjects in a realist style. So when you think of a scene painting, think of an American scene. It's portrayed realistically. Surrealist artists tapped the powers of their subconscious minds and imaginations to create paintings. Contrasting traditional lifelike sculpture, modernist sculptures made simplified, abstract, and non-representational works. For abstract expressionists, the process of painting was more important than the end result. Postmodernists drew from mass culture for inspiration, creating works that were more accessible to everyone. So we talk about mass culture. In a postmodernist piece, you might see, for example, a collage that has like pictures of famous people or famous architecture or famous news headlines. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and log into the part-time graduate's final assessment and you should do the same.
Okay, so question number one. How did Gian Lorenzo Bernini incorporate an Italian Baroque characteristic in his sculpture, David? Do you remember talking about Baroque? What is the synonym for Baroque? Drama, right? Let's see if we can find that word in one of the answers. Bernini made its main purpose to idealize the beauty of the human form. That's a classical idea, not a Baroque ideal. Bernini created the pose and facial features with a sense of calm. No, there's nothing calm about this sculpture. Bernini made a complete departure from classical and Renaissance sculpture. No, it's not a complete departure. It's still very beautiful and idealizes the human form, but that's not like the main purpose of it. Bernini engaged the viewer by making the sculpture break into the viewer's space. Remember that from our review? So that's the answer to that one. He's breaking into your space. Number two, which of the following is an accurate statement about Italian Baroque artist Caravaggio's approach to painting? Remember, we're looking for drama, and although the action happening in here may not be as dramatic, the lighting certainly is. This is incorporating chiaroscuro, which is that contrast of pure blacks against pure whites. Um, we might even have a subtle touch of tenebrism here, which is a chiaroscuro technique that creates a spotlight effect. We do have a little spotlight coming in from the window on some of the subjects. So let's see if we can find any of those types of Baroque characteristics in the answers. Oh, wait. Caravaggio used foreshortening to depict a sense of flattened space. Does this space look flat? Caravaggio painted religious scenes with idealized figures. Caravaggio focused on depicting narrative historical themes. Caravaggio created dramatic compositions that focused on realism. Hmm, which one of those sounds more Baroque to you? Well, I hope I've been successful in making you pick out that word dramatic and knowing that that goes with Baroque drama. When you see drama, you know that's the right answer for Baroque. Question three. What innovative and extreme lighting technique did Italian Baroque artist Caravaggio use in his paintings? Innovative and extreme lighting technique? I just talked about two of those, didn't I? What were they? Chiaroscuro, right, which is that contrast of light and dark, and tenebrism. Tenebrism takes that chiaroscuro a step further and it actually creates a spotlight on some of the subject matter in the image where you might find some subject matter to not be in the spotlight. That's tenebrism. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, bing. There it is. Question four. Which phrase best describes a characteristic of the paintings of French Baroque artist Nicolas Poussin? Let's look at the possibilities. The depiction of figures and landscapes from the artist's imagination. The rejection of classical Greek and Roman figurative and landscape ideals. The depiction of narrative subject with an organized idealized landscape. Or the nearly photographic recording of figures within a landscape. Well, this one wasn't necessarily in our review, so I'm going to give it to you. It's going to, when we're thinking of um, this French Baroque, we're going to be thinking idealized landscape. So idealized landscape. Which characteristic best describes a technique that Spanish Baroque artist Diego Velasquez used in his paintings? Once again, still, still Baroque. Velasquez used loose brush strokes for the figures and smooth, precise brush strokes for the background. Velasquez preferred to work spontaneously rather than carefully plan out his compositions. Velasquez captured many middle tones between dark and light to create structure and accentuate color. Velasquez used the circle as an organizing structure in which to place all of the figures and objects. We didn't see a lot of this in the review either, but we do see a lot of midtones. So midtones, we're, when we're thinking of like pure blacks and pure whites, yes, we definitely have some pure blacks and pure whites, but we also have a nice range of midtones, which give this sort of a realistic feel. 
so where do we see that? There we go. Now remember your test <laughs> is probably gonna have the answers or questions slightly different, but they're similar, right? All of the tests that you guys get are a little different, but they are on the same subject matter, so you should be able to figure out with these discussions. All right, our next question, question six. How did Baroque artist Rembrandt of the Netherlands apply paint to a canvas? Hmm. He carefully applied a thin coat of paint to create imperceptible changes in tonal values. Well, no, this is actually very thick paint. Rembrandt vigorously applied paint to quickly capture a single moment in time. Hmm. Rembrandt brushed the paint on smoothly to create solid looking figures. There's nothing smooth about the paint on this face. Rembrandt applied expression, expressive strokes of thick paint by using the impasto technique. Yeah, that sounds better. Nice, thick paint. That's the impasto technique. Question seven, what Rococo characteristic is evident in French artist Jean-Antoine Watteau's paintings? Rococo, so remember that's the ornate, frivolous, lighthearted period. The depiction of aristocrats within idyllic landscapes, figures that show no visible brush strokes, the use of strong variations of color, the use of neutral colors to enhance the subject's serious nature. There's nothing serious about it. Don't really have a lot of strong variations of color. Um, we do see brush strokes in this painting. So the depiction of aristocrats with an idyllic scenes, that's what that Rococo, that ornate flamboyant period was all about. Question eight, how did French artist Jean-Patrice Simeon Chardin used naturalist conventions in his paintings. So naturalist conventions means that they're painting it in a very realistic style. And remember that realism is all about painting subject matter that is really happening in life. Chardin depicted ordinary people and activities with a sense of realism. Chardin used delicate, lively brushstroke to depict aristocratic genres. This is definitely not aristocratic. It's more common, ordinary people. Chardin used theatrical lighting to add to the drama of the scene. There's some theatrical um, lighting here. True. Chardin incorporated the tenebrism technique developed by Caravaggio. What do you think is the best answer? You're going to want to go with ordinary pick ordinary people and activities with a sense of realism. That's basically what naturalism is all about. So naturalism, ordinary people, sense of realism. So that's why you would wanna pick that answer over the others, even though we do see some evidence of tenebrism and we do see the lighting um, adding to the drama of the scene. Okay, so question number nine. What architectural features of Monticello show that Thomas Jefferson based the design of the buildings on neoclassical ideas? And we kind of uh, talked about that a little bit. Uh, Jefferson used architectural moldings reclaimed from ancient Roman buildings. That means like these are actually from ancient Rome. Do you think so? No. Jefferson incorporated architectural features of Greek and Roman architecture. Absolutely. That's what classical means. It means it comes from that Greek and Roman architectural time. Jefferson demonstrated his preference of asymmetrical floor plans. There's nothing asymmetrical. Asymmetrical means it's not symmetrical. This is actually very symmetrical. We draw a line down the middle. They're mirror images on either side, pretty much. Jefferson rejected classical conventions in favor of new ideas. No, he's embracing classical inventions. So Definitely, Jefferson incorporated the architectural features of Greek and Roman architecture. Question 10. Which phrase best explains why Liberty Leading the People by Eugène Delacroix is a good example of romantic art? So we talked about romantic art, um, kind of rejecting this very serious classical period of neoclassicism, right? 
and um, the painting's color, lighting, and movement elicit an emotional response from viewers. The painting's controlled brushwork creates an accurate representation of the figures and background. The painting's subtle, low contrast in highlights and shadows models the figures. And the painting's sense of rationalism and reason were inspired by Renaissance art. Well, it's not going to be rational and reason, right? Because that's what they were rejecting. They were rejecting the rational and reasoning of the neoclassicists. So what do you think is the best answer? Well, these romantics were definitely trying to elicit an emotional response after all of that seriousness going on. They were using color, lighting, and movement to elicit emotional responses from viewers. Question 11. How did Louis Daguerre create his innovative daguerreotypes? Daguerre exposed a negative for a full day to capture intense light and shadow. Nope. Daguerre treated a negative so that it produced a shallow depth of field. Nope. Daguerre captured a permanent image with rich tonal variations and fine detail. Or Daguerre projected an image onto a metal plate that was then etched. No. So we're going to have to go with captured a permanent image with rich tonal values and fine detail. That's what that is. Question 12. How do the paintings of French artist Jean-Francois Millet exhibit characteristics of realism and naturalism? All right. So they depict a scene from everyday contemporary life by using lifelike colors and solid shapes. They combine elements of the real world with images taken from the artist's imagination. That one's definitely a no. They use a limited tonal range to depict contemporary figures in a flattened space. No, that space isn't flat. You can actually see way off in the distance. There are people back there too. They have a thick and pasto application of paint for the figures that give them a sculptural appearance. No, not at all. It's not a thick and pasto technique. Remember with realism and naturalism, what are we looking for? Everyday contemporary life, right? So everyday contemporary life is your, is your cue. That's realism and naturalism. Question 13. Which of the following is a way that realist Winslow Homer made prisoners from the front more lifelike? Hmm. Homer asked real soldiers to model for him in his studio? No. Homer made preparatory sketches of actual soldiers on the battlefield and at camp. Hmm. Homer used photographs that he took of soldiers as models for his painted figures. No. Homer used the camera obscura to trace the reflections of real soldiers on the canvas. No. He actually went out there on the battlefield and made some sketches, and then he took them back to his studio where he painted at that point. Question 14. How did French Impressionists such as Claude Monet capture their impressions of a scene on canvas? Let's find out. French Impressionists applied frenzied brushstrokes to solidly modeled figures by using light and shadow. French Impressionists use quick strokes of color in neutral hues that reflect the true colors of objects. French Impressionists use dabs of pure vibrant color to show changing light and weather conditions. French Impressionists snapped quick photographs of a scene to capture their impressions before painting. What is your gut telling you? Well, hopefully it's telling you that French Impressionists used dabs of pure, vibrant color to show changing light and weather conditions. That was one of the things about Monet, if you remember, is that he would paint the same scene under different weather conditions, different lighting conditions. So that was kind of your clue there. Question 15. How did Japanese woodblock prints influence French Impressionists Edgar Degas. Hmm. Like the Japanese artist who created woodblock prints, Degas depicted scenes from an elevated vantage point. Does, does it look like he's sitting up high? Degas used the same technique of carving images into a woodblock for printing. Like Japanese artists, Degas avoided using lines to outline figures. Actually, I do see some outlines, so I wouldn't think that would be correct. Degas' compositions are similar to those of Japanese prints in which figures are arranged 
on hor horizontal lines. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I'd have to go with the elevated vantage point. It does look kind of like maybe he's standing on a ladder looking down on the dancers. Question 16. What post-impressionist convention did Paul Zezan use in Mont Saint Victoire? Quick expressive brushstrokes that record objects and figures spontaneously. Patches of color. Remember me talking about that in the review? That define the objects in a carefully planned composition. Careful brushwork. That doesn't look very careful. That builds up realistically modeled figures. Definitely not realistic. Neutral earthy colors that create a sense of atmosphere. Well, we might find some neutral colors there. It's the patches of color that define the objects that are characteristically Cezanne. Question 17. Which of the following describes the use of color by post-impressionist Vincent van Gogh? Analogous colors that create harmony, highly representational color, bold color that conveys emotion, or naturalistic color. Hopefully, as soon as I said bold color that conveys emotion, your little light bulb in your head went off because remember, post-impressionists, right? Bold color, the whole point was to express their emotions. Question 18. How did symbolist Edward Monk use line and color in the screen? To create a sense of three-dimensional space, to enhance the effect of natural lighting, to express his feelings of fear and anxiety, to create carefully blended tonal values. Fear and anxiety, fear and anxiety. Just look at that face. Question 19, what characteristic describes late 19th century sculpture Auguste Rodin's work? Rodin's work captures a sense of movement and emotion through surface texture variations. Definitely a lot of surface texture there, right? And we know that this is a post-impressionist piece, so we'd be thinking of emotion, right? Rodin's work features figures placed on high pedestals to distance them from the viewers. Now we're actually feeling pretty close to it, in my opinion. Rodin's work depicts figures with little expression. Hmm, I don't know. I think that they've got quite a bit of expression. Rodin's work conveys his dislike of Renaissance sculpture by Donatello and Michelangelo. No, I don't think that really has anything to do with it. I think that his work is to create that movement and emotion through surface texture. Question 20. How did Art Nouveau artists such as Louis Comfort Tiffany use line and shape in their works? They use expressive lines and shapes that convey emotion. They use curvilinear curves, organic lines and shapes from nature. They use highly detailed textured lines and shapes or they use geometric lines and shapes to create rhythm. It's always gonna be curvy lines that imitate nature for our Art Nouveau. Question 21. Like many 20th century artists, the Fauves broke new ground. How did Fauvist Henri Matisse, ignore accepted conventions of traditional art in the Red Room. Matisse used the passage technique where one shape merges with another. Matisse used greatly simplified shapes to create a sense of depth. There's not a lot of depth in this. I mean, there is just because of that window and we can see off in the distance, but a lot of this just feels kind of flat, right? Matisse used intense, expressive colors that are not realistic. That sounds on key. Matisse used lines and colors that express the injustices of industrialized society. I'm not really getting that vibe. How about you? I'm getting intense, expressive colors, though. Question 22. How did artist Wassily Kandinsky incorporate expressionist characteristics in Improvisation 31? Sea battle. Can you see the ships at sea battling with one another? 
Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it expressionistic. <laughs> Kandinsky used splashes of color to capture the effects of sunlight on an object. Kandinsky used layers of thin and thick paint colors to build up the objects. Not seeing that. Kandinsky used bold, exaggerated lines and colors to communicate his inner feelings. That sounds about right. Kandinsky used lines and colors to create a non-representational artwork. That sounds about right, too. So what would you pick? Well, though you might be able to argue that it's a little non-representational, it still is, though. I mean, we can tell when we look at it that it is a battleship, <laughs> carefully. So we're going to go with those bold, exaggerated lines and colors to communicate his inner feelings. It's more about that for the expressionists. Our big clue there is the fact that they are called expressionists for a reason. It's because they're expressing or communicating their feelings. Question 23. How did Georges Brock use a synthetic cubism convention in still life, le jour? So remember that synthetic cubism is almost like collage-like. Brock used closely placed, nearly imperceptible dots of color to create an illusion of form. Well, that would be more like pointillism, right? From the Impressionism period. Brock depicted each object from a single point of view. Hmm. Brock used detailed shapes and textures that overlap in unexpected ways. That definitely is happening. Brock depicted objects from more than one vantage point at the same time. Hmm. So what makes this test so difficult is obviously the fact that you could look at a lot of the answers and, and see it in the artwork, right? But what you need to know about cubism is that one of the distinct characteristics of it we talked about in that review is that you are looking at objects from more than one vantage point at the same time and that's what makes them so confusing. Question 24. How did Pablo Picasso communicate a political statement in Guernica? Picasso used symbolism to depict an anti-poverty scene from his imagination. Eh. Picasso used fragmented distorted shapes to convey the suffering felt during war. Sounds about right. Picasso used shades of gray to condemn anti-immigration sentiments. No, nope, this wasn't an about anti-immigration. Picasso used simplified lines and shapes to tell of political corruption. Indeed, that is probably true, but it is the fragmented, distorted shapes that are conveying the suffering. This is actually um, the emotional response that people at this time had when they heard the news that Guernica had been bombed. Question 23, 25, sorry, 25. What is a distinguishing characteristic of surrealism as seen in The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali? Surrealist art uses symbolism based on classical Greek and Roman mythology. Do we see pillars? Symmetry? No. Surrealist art is based on ideas from the artist's imagination and subconscious mind. What do you think? Does that look like something you might see in a dream? Your subconscious mind? Surrealist art is based on an imagery taken from contemporary mystery novels? No. Surrealist art uses ideas conjured up by children interviewed by the artist. No, Dolly didn't interview children to get his ideas. These ideas came straight from his subconscious mind. He liked to create a dreamscape, if you will. Question 26. How did Grant Wood incorporate a convention of the style of regionalism in American Gothic? Regionalism, we kind of, um, we talked about scene art. 
Regionalism is a type of scene art. It's where you're in America during this period of time, and there are all of these different places across America, huge country, right? And they all have their own different kind of cultural scene happening. And so this regionalism is all about painting pictures or scenes to um, reflect the culture of specific regions, okay? And American Gothic is actually, um, has like some really cool Gothic symbolism here. And uh, this is not his wife. Um, I believe this is his daughter and, um, or niece or something like that. But anyway, yeah, it's definitely not his wife. But they're making fun of them because industrialization is happening now and people are getting modernized and we're looking at this specific region of the United States where they have not yet embraced modernity. They are actually like kind of imprisoned in their archaic world, in their gothic world. Wood depicted rural Midwestern values in clearly readable composition. Wood showed the loneliness of life on the American Great Plains. Wood depicted the hardships experienced by people during the Great Depression. Wood showed the influence of European modernistic movements such as Fauvism. Man, that's tough to answer. But we're gonna keep it real simple to the genre itself. And that is regionalism is simply depicting the rural Midwestern values in a clearly readable composition. That's all it's about. Although there may be some undertones of some of these other things there. Question 27 has a couple of options. The first one could be, what modernist conventions did Henry Moore use in Mother and Child? Moore incorporated features of realistic 19th century sculpture. Moore used abstract and simplified and exaggerated forms. More used bronze for the sculpture to emphasize strength, or more combined dramatic poses with calm facial expressions. Well, no, I mean, although that facial expression might look calm to you, it looks kind of frightened to me. Doesn't look a little frightened. So um, it's definitely not realistic, but it's very abstract. This is a mother holding her child. She's trying to protect her child from being um, captured and killed by the Nazis. Very sad. And then we have another one for question number 27. Um, which of the following is modernist characteristic of head of a woman by Amadeo Modigliani? So if you got this question, is it sophisticated symbolism and imagery, Baroque techniques used in a new and exciting way, a complex carving and casting technique, or abstraction of a figure into simple geometric forms? We're wanting to go with abstraction, right? Abstraction of a figure into simple geometric forms. So there we go. Modernist art, very simplified and abstracted. Question 29. What abstract expressionist innovation did Jackson Pollock exhibit in Autumn Rhythm, number 30? All right, so abstract expressionism. This is when they're more um, concerned about the process of making it. So Pollock asked children to work as his assistant so the painting would have a spontaneous look. You might think that a child painted that. Um, <laughs> Pollock attached brushes to a machine that made random marks in the painting. No, he made this himself. Pollock made the act of painting more important than the final artwork. The act of painting, the process, that sounds about right. Pollock included a jazz recording for viewers to listen to while viewing the painting. While that certainly could be done, Remember, it was the act or the process that was more important to abstract expressionists. And then question 30, which of the following statements explains how Robert Rosenberg made a state, an example of postmodern art? We kind of talked about this a little bit. Can't really see in here, but remember, they're going to have um, some features of popular culture in there. Look at, we've got the the signs, the street signs are in there. We've got the Statue of Liberty in there. So um, these symbols or images from modern or pop culture or whatever culture um, are going to represent that postmodern period. So 
Rosenberg incorporated imagery influenced by the Cubist and Fauvist movements. Rosenberg used images and symbols from his subconscious thoughts. Rosenberg created a non-representational artwork that few people can comprehend. <laughs> Rosenberg used images of American popular culture that people would easily recognize. That was the goal there. He wanted to make it more accessible to everyone since it would have a little bit of a little bit of imagery that they could all recognize and understand the meaning of. So that should wrap it up for you. Let me just check. So congratulations, graduating part-timers. I am thankful that we have the opportunity to have you attending Utah Virtual Academy and best of luck in all of your future endeavors. Mwah.